Hello and welcome back to section 6 of the course where we will present some general practices for designing a microservices architecture and provide some tips around related topics such as operating such an architecture or migrating from a monolithic architecture. In this section we will cover five parts. We'll start by discussing how we should approach the design of a microservices architecture, what's the importance of boundaries and how we can identify them successfully. We will then look at several practices and tips that can help us operate a microservices architecture as efficiently as possible. In the next topic, we will explore the concept of polyglot programming and persistence, why it's useful, and try to give several practical examples. In the fourth part, we will tackle the problem of migrating from a monolith to a microservices architecture, what are the possible pitfalls and how we can avoid them. Lastly, we'll conclude by taking a step back and reflecting on the fact that a microservices architecture, like everything else, has its own drawbacks and might not be appropriate for some cases. In this first part, we will look at how we should design a microservices architecture and what is the role of boundaries on this design. First of all, let's remember what's the basic value proposition of a microservices architecture. On the one hand, by moving to a microservices architecture, we are able to provide isolation and independence between teams so that they can deliver software faster. This isolation forces teams to think more carefully about their APIs and the way they communicate with other services because they need to be as decoupled as possible. On the other hand, we are capable of aligning the business direction with the technical structure. This means that ideally each team should not just own some systems, but they should own systems that belong to a specific business domain. This will allow the team to be more impactful since they can define business KPIs that they will try to improve, thus having concrete and measurable impact. A great mechanism for achieving these goals is by defining specific boundaries between services and teams. The tricky part is finding the right way to identify these boundaries. Now, if you recall the section about domain-driven design, you will remember that we talked about a concept called bounded contexts. So the most important tool for identifying these boundaries is first identifying deeply what our business is doing outlining the bounded contexts and then mapping these to separate systems or services. However, there are also some additional guidelines that can help us identify flaws in the structure of a microservices architecture. We'll go through some of these guidelines here. As we've seen in the past, two other concepts that can help us drive the design of our architecture are coupling and cohesion. Following the principle of high cohesion, we need to make sure that the boundary of each microservice is large enough so that the microservice is tackling a large enough business problem. The anti-pattern here is referred to as nanoservices, implying that their size is too small to provide enough value. For instance, let's say various services need information around the customer profile. Creating multiple services for different attributes of the profile such as one service providing the contact details and another one providing the photo of the customer might reduce the cohesion of our services significantly. Following the loose coupling principle, we need to make sure that each service is dependent to the least possible amount of services. Ideally, our architecture should look something like this diagram, where each problem is solved hierarchically by composing services recursively where the number of connections is balanced across services and there is no service with an extremely large number of connections. Of course, having a circular dependency in your architecture is a big red flag and usually an indicator of a deeper problem in the way you split these bounded contexts. A second guideline for designing your architecture is data ownership. By that, I mean that ideally, the system that is the authoritative source of a piece of data should be responsible for the full life cycle of that data. For example, when building a catalog, then single systems should be responsible both for the reads and the writes to the catalog, instead of having a separate system writing to this data store. 
This will make it easier to guarantee that business constraints that apply to the data are always satisfied. If you paid attention, you probably noticed that I used the term system instead of service, because what matters in this rule is the team that owns the software. To give an example, there are some cases where for performance reasons, rights are applied to a separate service and eventually propagate to the data store that will be the authoritative source. What matters in that case is that both of these services are part of the same system, which is ideally owned by the same team. The third guideline we could use is the transactional semantics required for a specific operation. If we have three services with three separate data stores, but a business operation needs to be performed across all databases as a single atomic transaction, then that's really hard in this setup because of the fact that distributed transactions are a hard thing to achieve. However, an architecture where all that data are kept in a single database that supports transactions and fronted by a single service might make things a lot easier. That said, you need to be careful and try to understand whether a business operation actually requires transactions or you could live with a system that is eventually consistent. We will see a practical example of that later in this section. Now that we've seen some basic guidelines, we'll look into some practical examples. Keep in mind that these are real life examples, but they've been made more generic and abstract so that we can understand what is the anti-pattern behind them, understand why we should avoid it and how some of the presented guidelines can protect us against it. In this example, we have three services. Service A is the highest level service, which calls service B. The color boxes inside service A and B illustrate the fact that they perform different business functionalities. However, both services need to call service C to retrieve some data. A practical problem that might come up here is that service C might not be that efficient, meaning that we cannot call it from both services, otherwise our overall system will be very slow. A quick countermeasure could be the following here. Since the data are retrieved already in service A, we could just pass it through to service B when we make the remote call. In this way, service B would not need to call service C anymore. This is a huge violation of encapsulation and couples these two services very strongly, since service A now has knowledge about the internals of service B. Of course, there are many technical ways to mitigate this issue, such as introducing a CAS. However, what we care about here is the structure of our architecture. This design smell might be an indication of a deeper problem. Given the fact that both the blue and the green functionality require data from service C, it's highly possible that both of these operations belong in the same context. As a result, by moving the blue functionality from service A to service B, we can remove the coupling between the services by not passing through data anymore. Doing that, we also increase the cohesion of service B, since now related functionality is located in the same service. This is a more classical example in a microservices architecture. We'll assume that our team owns the service colored in blue at the bottom. We are planning to release a new feature and we realize that in order for that feature to reach our customers, we need to make some changes to our upstream service so that it can make use of the new feature. In the worst case, that pattern goes on and we need to change their upstream as well so that they can also consume the new feature. Thinking about that, we can say that this structure made us less independent since improving our service was not enough despite the claims that a microservices architecture makes us more independent and agile. This problem is usually caused by the fact that the communication between services is strongly coupled, requiring us to update the APIs between the services for any change. In this case, we could benefit by making our APIs more generic and loosely coupled. As an example, assuming that our service is providing different payment methods, we could structure our API so that there is a common model for all our payment systems, 
so that introducing a new payment system can be automatically consumed by the upstream systems and presented to the customers. Back in section 1, we gave a very similar example of how to achieve that, so feel free to revisit this part where we did a more deep analysis. Of course, depending on technical details and limitations of third-party systems, this might not always be feasible, but we should strive for it. So far, we looked at what we can do to split responsibilities correctly between services, so that our microservices architecture is nicely structured, allowing our development teams to work efficiently and our systems to be performant. After achieving that, we still have to be careful so that we structure appropriately each service internally, so that the code is as maintainable as possible. A very common design pattern for services is the hexagonal architecture. This architecture proposes separating our service into different layers, where each layer has a different responsibility. The first and most important part is our domain model, which contains all the components that model our business domain. These components encapsulate some core data of our business domain, along with the necessary business logic. The next layer is the application layer, which contains components required for our application to function, such as framework-related components, or components that are responsible for orchestrating the use of some components from the core domain. Lastly, there is the infrastructure layer that contains low-level components that solve infrastructural problems, such as connecting to a database, calling another service, communicating with third-party systems, or even receiving data from humans. These layers allow us to distribute responsibilities and make our code easier to understand. However, ideally the way these layers collaborate should follow specific rules, if we want them to be easy to modify and understand. More specifically, the application layer will depend on the infrastructure layer in order to fetch data from dependencies, and it will also depend on the core model, which will provide all the business logic. In some cases, our infrastructure layer might depend on the core model. To understand why, you can think of the example we gave on previous sections about the dependency inversion principle. Following that principle, we would have defined our core model and the infrastructure layer will just provide the implementations of the interfaces exposed by our core model. However, sometimes this is not possible and the application layer is responsible for transforming the data returned from the infrastructure layer to the data modeled by our core domain model. However, what is really important to call out here is that the core domain should not depend on anything. The way we model our business domain should not be affected at all by the application framework or the kind of database we will decide to use. In this video, we discussed several practices that can help us structure properly our microservices architecture and design our services internally.